Good morning and good afternoon. I'm Dr. Jill Einstein, the Director of Physician Engagement of the MAVEN Project, and welcome to the 36th session of MAVEN Project's COVID-19 update, led by Dr. Debbie Gold, a retired infectious disease doctor and hospital epidemiologist from Kaiser San Francisco. Dr. Gold is joined by MAVEN's physician volunteer panelists, Dr. Hunter Hansfield, infectious disease, Dr. Ramona Doyle, pulmonary and critical care, Dr. Lois Friedman, psychiatry, Dr. Judy and Smith, psychiatry, and Dr. Libby Sauter, obstetrics and gynecology. Today, I'm pleased to welcome MAVEN Project cardiology volunteer, Dr. Charles Schulman, who will be presenting for the first half on cardiac issues associated with COVID-19, then followed by Dr. Gold. Dr. Schulman was an assistant clinical professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, and he is currently a corresponding member of the faculty of Harvard Medical School and a senior physician at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. Dr. Schulman is a fellow of the American College of Cardiology, a fellow of the American Heart Association, and a clinical specialist in hypertension of the American Society of Hypertension, and many more things that are um, on his CV, so we're very pleased to have him here today. The MAVEN Project is a telehealth nonprofit that supports primary care providers working at safety net clinics across the country. Our experienced volunteer physicians offer provider to provider medical consults, one on one mentoring, and customized education sessions. Thank you to our generous donors who make all of our work, including this session, possible. Please feel free to share these COVID session recordings with colleagues and friends, and you may invite them to attend the live sessions as well. In honor of Veterans Day today, I wanted to send out a special recognition to our United States veterans who have served our country. Thank you very much for your service. And we'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Shulman. Dr. Shulman, if you can go ahead and share your screen, please. Okay. Uh, there we go. Um, okay. Uh, so thank you, very, thank you very much, Jill. Uh, and uh, it turns out uh, that I am a veteran. <laughs> so I suppose there's, that, that was a nice segue <laughs> to, my, to my talk. Um, uh, my uh, uh, talk is on uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, and the heart. Um, why, oops, why is this not working? My screen is frozen. Uh, let's try this again. Okay, there we go. So, um, uh, I have actually two cases um, that I thought I would present. Um, uh, uh, as uh, vignettes during this uh, the talk. And the first, the first is that of a 73-year-old physician who was seen at Beth Israel Deaconess Milton uh, uh, Hospital, one of the uh, satellite uh, community hospitals of the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Uh, he's a 73-year-old man with a previous history of hypertension, diabetes, coronary disease, and atrial flutter, who presented to the emergency room at Milton uh, with fatigue, weakness, fevers, and two days of cough. Uh, this was back in April uh, that, that these events took place. Um, uh, at the time, he was sent home, but he came back two days later with progressive shortness of breath, uh, and uh, uh, he, he was transferred to uh, the tertiary uh, medical center, uh, the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Um, uh, but uh, experienced rapid decompensation after his arrival in the emergency room, uh, requiring intub intubation at that point, uh, and then prompt transfer. Um, this is his chest x-ray, and uh, as uh, you don't have to be a pulmonologist to see that there are bilateral confluent uh, parenchymal uh, opacities, um, uh, very extensive. Uh, he was uh, uh, one uh, very sick man. He was, uh, this is his electrocardiogram, which was taken uh, uh, after uh, he was intubated, paralyzed, and on a moderate dose of uh, levofed uh, for uh, uh, pressure support. At the time, his troponin 
was uh, 3.6. Uh, and what the electrocardiogram shows um, uh, is uh, ST elevations in one and AVL uh, with, T -wave, with a T wave inversion and lead AVL. Um, uh, what's not so obvious is that there are also uh, ST depressions in lead uh, two uh, and in AVR, uh, which are consistent with pericarditis. Um, uh, uh, this is the, later that day, he went into atrial fibrillation, uh, his uh, STT abnormalities worsened. Uh, and at that time, his troponin was uh, 5.98. Um, subsequently, sinus rhythm was restored. Uh, but what you can see here, uh, besides what looks like some evolution of his STT abnormalities um, in the uh, uh, anterolateral lateral leads, uh, is <coughs> prolonged QT interval um, uh, of uh, uh, you see uh, much much prolonged uh, compared to the first. I'll show you the first. Uh, uh, here, look, look here. There's there's a QT interval, and then uh, look here. It's it's much prolonged. Uh, at the time, um, he was he was treated with what we knew at the what we knew, uh, which included included hydroxychloroquine and, and uh, azithromycin. Um, he unfortunately uh, did not do well and expired. Um, uh, which brings us to the uh, various effects of uh, COVID-19 on um, uh, cardiologic uh, practice uh, and on our patients. Uh, there are another number of aspects that I've listed here. So uh, one is the effect of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic on other aspects of cardiac care. Uh, there is the issue of pre-existing diseases uh, and risk factors for poor outcomes. Uh, there are as uh, cardiac injury and uh, 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 information, we'll present some information about that. And then um, we'll consider some uh, post-acute care, post-acute illness uh, or convalescent care. Um, this is uh, a study that showed uh, what has happened to hospitalizations for acute cardiac conditions, uh, two of them, heart failure and acute myocardial infarction, uh, during the time of COVID. And what you can see is that uh, uh, heart failure admissions uh, have fallen um, by what looks like about half, uh, and acute myocardial infarction admissions uh, have fallen by uh, uh, least, uh, you know, uh, at a varying amount, but, but it looked like by, by half anyway. Um, uh, a recent study, uh, 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 which appeared online today, um, suggested that um, primary stenting for acute myocardial infarction uh, was now, uh, uh, when uh, assessed in a, in a registry, was down by 20%. Uh, which is certainly consistent with uh, this information. Um, uh, and uh, as important is that uh, the hospital mortality for acute myocardial infarction is higher uh, than in, uh, at the, in, during the baseline time. The causes for this are multifactorial. Uh, uh, and I think we're, we're all aware of these causes. Patients are avoiding emergency care for fear of uh, contracting uh, COVID-19. Uh, uh, people have lost their health insurance. Uh, there's an increased threshold for hospitalizations for any condition uh, by the clinicians. Uh, and uh, uh, people uh, have changed uh, lifestyles and self-management in the setting of social distancing. Um, these are uh, pre-existing pre conditions uh, which uh, served as risk factors for fatal outcome in hospitalized subjects with COVID-19. This is a study that kind of came from Wuhan, China, was published uh, um, 
uh, early uh, in the uh, pandemic. Um, uh, during, uh, I would, uh, as as I recall, the second quarter of uh, 2020. Uh, and what you see is that the, that hypertension was present in in more than half of the patients uh, as a risk factor for uh, poor outcomes. But diabetes, coronary artery disease, and then mal uh, other diseases, malignancies, uh, renal diseases, COPD, uh, and hepatitis B were also found. Uh, this is a study that just appeared uh, uh, Monday, um, uh, comparing uh, outcomes uh, in patients who had previous heart failure. And it, uh, uh, if you, uh, I'll direct your attention to the lower right here. Uh, ICU stays uh, were uh, uh, twice as uh, were at uh, were doubled. Um, uh, intubation was tripled, uh, and uh, the mortality was uh, doubled in patients with previous uh, histories of uh, heart failure. So this, is, this clearly is a pre-existing condition uh, of, some, of uh, major importance. What are the mechanisms of cardiac injury um, uh, from, the, from the virus? Uh, uh, the virus, of course, causes lung injury, which can result in uh, oxygen supply demand imbalance, uh, uh, resulting in what's called type 2 acute myocardial infarction, the supply demand imbalance, not uh, due to a clot. But it can also, uh, with, uh, with uh, increases in inflammatory markers, uh, lead to uh, clot, uh, or to pla plaque rupture and occlusive clot, um, uh, causing a, what's called a type 1 acute myocardial infarction, which is myocardial infarction due to uh, uh, clot. But uh, inflammation related injury can also affect the uh, myocardium uh, as well. Uh, the uh, uh, um, uh, 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 um, there is direct vir uh, my viral myocardial invasion as a cause. Uh, there is stress cardiomyopathy as one of the causes, and there's microvascular thrombosis. Uh, and we'll talk more about uh, microvascular thrombosis uh, uh, later on. Uh, this shows the uh, inflammatory markers uh, in survivors and non survivors of uh, hospitalizations uh, 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 with uh, cardiac conditions. And what you see is the blue line uh, represents uh, survivors and the red lines uh, represent uh, heightened uh, uh, outpouring of IL-6, of uh, ferritin, uh, serum ferritin, and uh, uh, troponin. Um, and uh, one study performed uh, at, in the Mount Sinai Hospital System in New York uh, showed that uh, uh, troponin levels uh, correlate with um, severity of illness. Um, so if I, I direct your attention to the right side of the slide here, uh, and if uh, uh, the, the box with the green represents uh, all hospitalizations, uh, red represents uh, deaths and uh, uh, the blue represents hospital discharges. So that in patients with uh, uh, troponin levels that were uh, within the no normal range, uh, most people were uh, discharged. And as the troponins uh, range, uh, ranged upward and were elevated from mildly to more severely, uh, uh, deaths increased and discharges decreased. Now, considering uh, arrhythmias in COVID-19 patients, the most common arrhythmia uh, is sinus tachycardia. 
um, uh, pathologic arrhythmias include atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, and ventricular uh, arrhythmias, including either uh, monomorphic or polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. The differential diagnosis of wide complex tachycardia uh, is, is the same as for non-COVID patients. Uh, and uh, ICU ad admissions uh, uh, were found to have a tenfold increase in arrhythmia risk and cardiac arrest was associated with in-hospital mortality, so that the severity of illness was an independent marker for cardiac arrest and, and, and arrhythmias. Uh, what about thrombosis? Uh, venous thromboembolism and thrombosis is very common, almost 30% among inpatients. Uh, there are, for example, uh, strokes that occur uh, in young patients, and frequent uh, post-mortem findings of pulmonary emboli. Um, and uh, post-mortem findings of multivascular microthrombi, more often unsuspected pre-mortem. Pre um, uh, and another study from the Mount Sinai group, uh, anticoagulation during hospitalization was associated with better outcomes. Um, uh, of course, a therapeutic trial uh, would be uh, indicated uh, so that uh, uh, we could ha get more, more data and information regarding whether uh, prophylactic uh, uh, anticoagulation uh, is needed over and above, uh, excuse me, whether therapeutic uh, 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 anticoagulation is needed over and above prophylactic uh, anticoagulation. As you can see here, um, uh, both of them uh, led to uh, better outcomes. Uh, the, other, the other question is whether noxaparin uh, 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 or the new oral anticoagulants uh, are, are, are indicated. Uh, cardiovascular disease management in COVID-19 patients um, it basically follows the usual uh, guidelines uh, for treatment for these conditions. Um, for ST elevation MI, um, uh, primary uh, uh, percutaneous intervention with stents uh, is, is indicated if, if you can be certain of the diagnosis. Um, uh, if there's some question, uh, thrombolysis uh, that may be used uh, more frequently now uh, than it has been uh, in the era of primary stenting. Um, bedside echocardiograph and cardiogram uh, may be extremely useful uh, if there is some uncertainty as to whether you're dealing with uh, ST elevation MI or myocarditis. Uh, for non-ST elevation MI, again, uh, Guideline-directed therapy with aspirin, heparin, uh, statins, and beta blockade, blockade is indicated. Um, uh, we're trying to keep people out of the cath lab, uh, although if there's a high clinical suspicion of acute coronary occlusion, that patient should be uh, uh, catheterized and, and undergo coronary angiography. Um, for myocardial injury and myocarditis, Stress-induced cardiomyopathy. Uh, uh, one goes by the guideline-directed uh, medical therapy for cardiomyopathies. Um, uh, these inhibitors uh, uh, or angiotensin receptor blockers, um, uh, beta blockers, and um, uh, spironolactone uh, uh, are uh, indicated for uh, patients who have a low ejection breath. Uh, uh, one would trend their troponin, their BNP, and monitor for arrhythmias. Uh, there is an, ex an exercise limitation for patients suffering from myocarditis. I'm going to talk about that uh, later on. Um, uh, the, the treatment for heart failure is the standard uh, heart failure treatment. 
uh, daily weights, intakes and out intake and output, diuretics, uh, and monitoring of electrolytes and renal function. Um, uh, one issue that was uh, more prominent early in the in the pandemic uh, was uh, prolonged uh, uh, QTC interval uh, and uh, torsade de point. Torsade de point is uh, means twisting of the point. Uh, it is uh, polymorphic uh, as opposed to monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. And there's an, uh, illust an, an example of this uh, at the bottom of the slide. Uh, so what you can see here is uh, a sinus beat uh, followed by a uh, PVC, which sets off uh, a run of polymorphic VP. A polymorph uh, uh, torsade refers to the fact that the points are upright and then down in the same lead. So this is a nice example of polymorphic QT. Um, <laughs> the QT intervals uh, uh, would be assessed. Uh, uh, QTC, QTC correct, the corrected QT of uh, less than 450 milliseconds. Uh, there's no uh, specific treatment. Uh, normal is uh, 470 in men and 480 in women. Uh, and uh, those numbers, between those numbers and 500, uh, one uh, uh, carefully assesses uh, uh, cardiac rhythm. Uh, and also, one should look to stop uh, any QTC prolonging agents of which there are many, not just um, uh, uh and azithromycin. If the QTC is longer than 500, that's it. That's the risk. That's the danger. Uh, and so you have to. Uh, that that's a that's a, a a point at which treatment is indicated. Um, these are a number of the medications which were under consideration for the treatment of. Uh, COVID-19. Uh, here are uh, the anti-malarials and azithromycin. Uh, statins have been uh, shown to be uh, helpful, uh, although it's not a specific modality. Uh, uh, HIV protease inhibitors uh, were uh, tried. Um, and uh, uh, azithromycin, anti-malarials, uh, and um, uh, the HIV protease inhibitors uh, prolong the, Q, the QTC intervals. Um, that novel antivirals such as remdesivir does not. Uh, and the IL-6 antagonists such as Oseluzumab, I can't pronounce it, um, does not. And the antibody cocktail that Regeneron has just uh, introduced um, uh, or that, that Regeneron is testing, uh, it does not. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> the recent uh, uh, NIH guideline update uh, from a month ago suggests against, recommends against the use of antimalarials, HIV protease inhibitors, and the IL-6 antagonists. Um, this is a brief um, uh, management uh, outlook uh, for the QTC in COVID-19 patients. Um, as I said, the, uh, assess the baseline ECG, or assess the uh, QTC interval. Uh, normal is less than 470 milliseconds in men and 480 in women. Uh, highly abnormal is greater than 500. Um, you know, the Mayo Clinic protocol uh, was, you know, first uh, re recognized the increased risk of torsade de point um, and stop medicines that prolong the QT. Um, correct uh, electrolyte abnormalities uh, so that you would like to maintain potassium uh, greater than four uh, and magnesium greater than two and of course, uh, monitor the patient. Uh, the treatment for at the point is intravenous magnesium.
Um, now, th those were all parts of the acute phase. Um, uh, uh, I'm now, we'll now turn our attention to what's called, uh, what would be considered a convalescent phase, phase from something like 21 days to several months. Uh, we have no information on, on the chronic uh, phase, if you will, uh, of uh, coronavirus. Um, uh, you know, the mechanisms that I already mentioned uh, as uh, causing myocardial infarction uh, might lead to uh, um, causing myocardial injury, excuse me, um, uh, might lead to a number of uh, long-term conditions, including uh, cardiomyopathies, either ischemic or not ischemic, um, uh, subclinical systolic and diastolic abnormalities, um, and uh, arrhythmias. Uh, this is um, uh, 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 from a, a registry uh, showing persistent symptoms two months after hospitalizations for acute COVID. Uh, this is not necessarily cardiac, uh, but uh, half the people still continue to complain of fatigue, uh, and 40, more than 40% of them of uh, uh, shortness of breath, although much of, that, much of that is pulmonary in origin as opposed to cardiac in origin. Um, second case that I uh, will speak about is uh, Eduardo Rod Rodriguez uh, of the Boston Red Sox. Uh, a pitcher for the Boston Red Sox, a very talented pitcher, I might add, uh, of the Boston Red Sox. He tested positive for COVID uh, in early July, and then later, uh, and I, I have to tell you, I don't remember the exact uh, length of time, uh, later he reported fatigue while he was uh, pitching, uh, uh, which led to a cardiac MR, which was positive for myocarditis. So he was promptly uh, put on the shelf, uh, and he has not uh, participated uh, um, uh, since that time. Of course, the baseball season is now over. Red Sox did not to do well and did not make it into the playoffs, uh, but everybody knows that. Um, Post-COVID-19 um, uh, abnormalities uh, have been a worry in terms of how much uh, activity people could engage in uh, following uh, infection with COVID. Uh, and there are uh, three studies uh, which uh, addressed that issue uh, in recovered patients. Uh, the first was a German study of 100 recently recovered patients, uh, two months following diagnosis, 71% uh, of the, whom had elevated troponins uh, in that group of patients, 78% of them had cardiac involvement, uh, and 60% had ongoing uh, myocardial inflammation, uh, which was uh, independent of pre-existing conditions, the severity and course of the illness and the time of the, from the original diagnosis. Uh, that was uh, bluntly very scary. And uh, uh, that study and the Ohio State study uh, uh, led to the cancellation of sports seasons um, and uh, football, uh, which has uh, subsequently uh, been allowed to come back. But um, uh, it was a, a real worry in terms of how many people, how many people who recovered from COVID-19 had had these abnormalities. Um, in the Ohio State study, 29 college athletes with uh, mild uh, or no symptoms uh, were tested uh, 11 to 53 days after their quarantine ended, uh, four of whom had uh, myocarditis and eight of whom had um, uh, gadol a late gadolinium enhancement, which means scarring uh, showing up on their cardiac MR study. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the patients, uh, the, the athletes with myocarditis, of course, uh, should be uh, treated according to the myocarditis guidelines. Uh, uh, whether uh, athletes who had late gadolinium enhancement, that is evidence of scar, uh, 
there's very little evidence, uh, very little data uh, to what exactly to do about that. Uh, and then uh, <clears throat> last week, a West Virginia study uh, uh, was published online uh, in uh, uh, Cardiovascular Imaging, the Journal of the College of Cardiology. Um, uh, 160 college, college athletes were screened in August. Uh, 53 of them had positive um, uh, COVID-19 PCR uh, nasopharyngeal swabs. Uh, I thought that was the most amazing uh, part of this study. I mean, we're talking about a third, uh, you know, over a 30% incidence of uh, positivity. Of those uh, with positive uh, uh, more than a third of them had had evidence of resolving pericard pericarditis. Uh, about 12 to 16 percent had evidence of myocardial involvement, uh, and then some had both. Um, again, we don't exactly know what the implications of all this are in terms of uh, whether uh, participating in athletics is make this worse have no effect at all. In light of all of that, uh, except for the West Virginia study, um, uh, a group of uh, cardiologists who um, are uh, sport medicine cardiologists uh, uh, developed the following guidelines for return to play after COVID-19 infection. Um, uh, these are adults and the, on the side will be uh, children under the age of 15. Uh, for asymptomatic patients, um, uh, rest and no exercise for 10 days from the time of a positive test. Uh, for mild symptoms, 10 days from uh, 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 symptom onset, uh, presuming that symptoms have totally resolved. Um, the, mild the difference between mild symptoms and moderate symptoms is whether or not they're uh, above or below the neck. Uh, so that for, uh, uh, and in, for the milder patients, they're recommending no, no cardiovascular testing, uh, but consider it on an individual basis, uh, uh, you know, rather than, rather than a community-wide basis. Um, for those with moderate symptoms, uh, rest and no exercise for 10 days from symptom resolution uh, 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 and and then risk stratification uh, of with uh, electrocardiogram, uh, troponin, uh, and uh, echo. Uh, if there are no abnormalities found, uh, they're cleared to resume play. Um, if abnormalities are found, um, uh, especially echo abnormalities and uh, cardiac imaging, perhaps with uh, cardiac MR, uh, would be indicated. Uh, for those with severe symptoms who are hospitalized, presumably having had troponin levels in cardiac imaging while they're in the hospital, uh, rest and no exercise for at least 14 days from symptom resolution. Uh, and then if testing has not been done in the hospital, uh, uh, testing should be done at that point. Uh, in any case, there should be a slow and graded resumption of activity uh, per athletic trainers. Uh, this is uh, for children, and the, the recommendations are similar, um, uh, except um, uh, perhaps uh, for moderate symptoms or severe symptoms, uh, the wait is a little longer. Uh, and then if symptoms return, or if there are new symptoms, then uh, a repeat evaluation uh, should be uh, undertaken with testing likely to include uh, cardiac MR. Uh, if clinically significant cardiac injury is uh, diagnosed at that point, uh, one follows the guidelines based on myocarditis, which are uh, no exercise for three to six months and then retesting. And presumably, uh, and if everything is normal, uh, ventricular systolic function is normal, normalized serum markers and, of uh, injury and heart failure have returned to normal, um, and there are no clinically relevant arrhythmias, 
then uh, they can uh, go back to uh, exercising and uh, continuing forward. <clears throat> and these are some recommendations for outpatient management of patients with COVID uh, or at high risk for COVID. And uh, th this, was, this was published early on. I think we're really doing a number of these things already. Um, uh, but uh, one point that I did want to make is that um, uh, ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor uh, blockers should be continued. Uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, virus enters itself through the ACE2 uh, receptor site, uh, and it was thought that we should not, initially it was thought that we should not uh, use ACE inhibitors in arms, but that turned out not to be the case. Um, and, you know, we should encourage people to have patient visits via telehealth rather than delaying uh, or deferring visits. Uh, cardiac rehabilitation should continue, but perhaps focus more on uh, cardiac rehabilitation. Um, and uh, that I would uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. And I thought I would close with this uh, thought. <laughs> That's great. Dr. Shulman, thank you so much um, for giving that talk about um, cardiac issues with COVID-19. That was really great and thorough. Nice to do a deep dive onto that. So thank you so much. And um, you can go ahead and stop sharing your slides. And then Dr. Gold, I'll have you put up your slides. So thanks again, Dr. Shulman. You're quite welcome. Great. Uh, Debbie, you may be on mute still. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Schulman, for that um, great uh, presentation. Um, it's odd, I can't seem to, oh, there we go. Okay, what I say today is relevant to today. I'm gonna have a, um, I'm gonna be skipping around a lot to get to things that I think are really important. Um, and the rest of it will be next week. I think this is worth a read. It'll take about two minutes to read this short piece in JAMA from this week um, that uh, uses findings from uh, changes of the brain in Alzheimer's disease to try to explain how people can glom onto uh, science denial and COVID conspiracy theories. I thought it was just fascinating. Um, CDC has published um, updated infection prevention recommendations uh, for clinics. They it updated this last week, and you may want to take a look at this. It's a very long document, and it's hard to tell what the new things are compared to the old things, but in the beginning, they said that they are presenting different options for screening uh, individuals prior to entry into a clinic. Uh, there is information about factors that could impact the readings of thermometers if you're using those for screening. Um, they provide some resources regarding ventilation systems and then an FAQ about the use of PPE in clinics. And that's the link. Um, so it's really hard to, I, I'm going to skip over this, but we are over uh, 10 and a half million cases in the United States and uh, closing in quickly on 250,000 deaths. Probably we will get there in the next week. Um, we are, um, uh, last week I said we're about a month behind uh, Western Europe, but actually um, we are now exceeding uh, Spain, France, the UK, Italy, and Germany. Um, and uh, so, and the only, there's only two countries that I put on here that are above us, Israel and Belgium, which are in the midst of really dire situations right now. Um, we are in unprecedented times now. Um, yesterday, we had almost 140,000 new cases, um, which we have not seen before. We haven't actually seen anything close to that. And we are about twice as many cases as the maximum that we saw during the summer in a day. Um, and 
uh, are, so not only are the cases rising rapidly, up almost 70% in the last two weeks, but now deaths are starting to rise more rapidly as well, up 23% in the last two weeks. Um, and these are the um, top uh, states, although uh, cases are rising in every state, but not Puerto Rico. Um, North Dakota is still leading the pack here. And the governor has just announced uh, that uh, healthcare workers who are COVID positive uh, can go ahead and work if they don't have any symptoms. What a great idea. Um, Wisconsin is looking at uh, severe shortages in their nursing homes and has, um, they are thinking about having family members of residents in nursing homes come in to, um, to uh, give care to their relatives. And uh, my best friend uh, lives in Minnesota and at her hospital, they are talking about turning off uh, elective surgeries again. These are data from the Atlantic's uh, COVID tracking project on hospitalizations. And as you can see, we are having a very steep rise in hospitalizations. And these are not nursing home patients, as we saw in our last two peaks. Nursing home patients, although cases are rising as are deaths in nursing homes, they are not, uh, they are not comprising the largest proportion of hospitalizations. And uh, so the, these are, uh, these are more, I guess, younger individuals. Um, and yesterday we saw almost 62,000 uh, people hospitalized in this country for uh, COVID-19. Here's a new thing, or, or maybe it's an old thing that's just being uh, de described now. It is test avoidance. Uh, individuals who don't wear masks are also now declining testing. Um, they are people who may present to a clinic with uh, typical COVID symptoms, but do not want to do testing because they want to uh, stay off the radar screen of the Department of Public Health. And they say that their illness is none of their business. They don't want contact tracers calling them and asking them for their contacts because that's an in, in, um, interfering with their liberties. And um, there are some individuals who are going so far as to refuse pre-op testing. Um, some of these individuals have a fear of isolation and quarantine. College students may have this because they want to continue to go to class if they have in-class instruction. Uh, athletes on uh, teams may decline testing because if they have one positive on the team, the whole uh, sports program for that sport has to shut down. Um, and there are families in um, Brooklyn who are sort of sending out emails to other families saying, if your kid is sick, keep them home, but don't allow testing because if our school has only one or two more cases, they're gonna close down school. Um, and then of course, uh, uh, Congressman Grassley, uh, uh, oh no, he's a Senator. Senator Grassley uh, declined testing even though three of his uh, close Senate uh, uh, colleagues had COVID-19 um, because he wanted to be absolutely certain that the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee could uh, continue its work in uh, uh, getting Amy Coney Barrett on the Supreme Court. Um, all of this just um, sort of begs the question about how much uh, the case counts are now uh, underestimated, and it may be more than we think. CDC issued an update on masks yesterday. They recommend community use of mask, which is what they're what they're the term they're using for universal masking, specifically non-valve, multi-layer cloth masks to prevent transmission of COVID uh, to SARS-CoV-2. Um, they also say that cloth masks not only prevent transmission to others, but will pr protect the wearer from exposure to droplets through filtration of droplets less than 10 microns in size. And if uh, that argument is not convincing, they also say that the increase in universal masking by just 15% could prevent the need for lockdowns and reduce associated losses of up to $1 trillion, which is about 5% of GDP. They um, list 45 references, which have been available publicly for a long time, but it just they just happened to get to this yesterday. Um, so it may be a post-election sort of, um, they feel that they can go ahead and, and issue more stringent um, directions to the public, and that's a great thing. 
as you have undoubtedly heard, Pfizer uh, made an announcement yesterday about their vaccine. Recall this is an mRNA vaccine that requires two doses and storage at minus 70. Um, they, did re they released a press um, announcement on Monday that did not include any data whatsoever. Um, it was the analysis of their first interim analysis of their phase three data that was done by an independent data safety monitoring board. They had uh, over 43,000 participants enrolled, which is almost reaching their goal of 44,000. Um, and then 39,000 who actually received two doses of the vaccine. And in this group, they had 94 evaluable cases of COVID-19. They stated without of data that the vaccine efficacy rate was above 90% at seven days after the second dose or 28 days after the first dose. And they did not see any serious safety signals thus far. Uh, they will complete their phase three when they have had a total of 160 confirmed cases, which, and that should be quite soon given the number of cases. The, the rise in cases that we're seeing all over the world. Um, they plan to have 50 million doses ready by the end of 2020, which will be enough to vaccinate 25 million people because you need two doses per person, and 1.3 billion doses by the end of 2021. They will seek EUA application when uh, they have the two-month safety data completed, which should be at the end of this month. Now, this is very good news, even though we don't have the actual data. Um, and it confirms that the spike protein was the correct target, and it bodes well for other vaccine candidates that are also uh, targeting spike protein. Um, and it suggests that they will have similar success, hopefully. Eli Lilly's monoclonal antibody um, has an update as well. The name of their drug is Bamlanivimab. Oh my God, where do they get these names? Um, which is a monoclonal antibody against spike uh, protein. It is the monoclonal that Chris Christie got during his seven day stay in the ICU. Uh, importantly, it is given by a single IV infusion as soon as possible after a positive test, but certainly within 10 days of onset of symptoms. The FDA granted emergency use on Monday the target population is anyone over the age of 12 who weighs 40 kilograms or more, um, who has mild to moderate disease that does not require hospitalization, and uh, some, you ha also have to have uh, be at high risk for progression, like being over 65 or having a, a comorbid condition that would confer increased risk. Um, so the EUA is based on the finding of reduced need for hospitalization or ED visits that I showed a couple of weeks ago in high-risk high individuals. And a direct quote from their press release was, the safety and effectiveness of this investigational therapy continues to be evaluated, so it has not been established. And possible side effects are anaphylaxis and infusion-related reactions, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, dizziness, headache, itching. So more to come on this. I'm sure Regeneron will be seeking EUA very soon for their monoclonal cocktail. Um, and uh, there has been no independent oversight board uh, to give advice to the FDA about these monoclonal antibodies, unfortunately. This is an awesome study. I just want to spend a few minutes on it. It has not been uh, published, but it is being reviewed for publication um, and peer, peer review and hopefully publication at Science. And if you like the UCSF's AeroNABs, you will like this study. Um, it was done at Columbia, Cornell, and at the Erasmus Medical Center in uh, the Netherlands. And it is the uh, discovery of a lipopeptide, which is a cholesterol particle that is linked to a peptide or a chain, a short chain of amino acids. And this peptide exactly matches a stretch of amino acids on the spike protein. And it prevents the viral envelope from fusing with the host cell membrane. The, um, this uh, lipopeptide is administered as a nasal spray and it attaches to cells in the nose and the lungs, and it hangs out for about 24 hours, so only needs to be given once a day. It's very cheap to produce. It's a freeze-dried white powder that can be mixed up into solution by a pharmacist um, and is stable in the powder form or in liquid form. It does not require re uh, refrigeration, and it is a really strong candidate for pre-exposure prophylaxis or early post-exposure prophylaxis, same as UCSF's AeroNav. 
So this is a schematic. There are two peptide, uh, chain, two peptide chains, short amino acid chains, connected to a cholesterol um, moiety. And this is a graphic showing the uh, effect on inhibition of infusion by the peptide, uh, by uh, concentration of the peptide. So at low concentrations, it um, inhibits fusions at a low rate, but once you get up to about um, 10 to the two uh, nano, moles of, um, of this compound, it inhibits 100% of, in, uh, of inhibition. Uh, it, it inhibits 100% of fusion um, events. And this is looking at, the red is wild type, and then they looked at several variants of SARS-CoV-2 here um, that all have, are very effective at um, these concentrations at 10 to the 2 nanomoles. And then down here in the blue line is um, SARS, and then this is MERS. So not as good against these um, variants, but excellent against all of the SARS-CoV-2 isolates that they looked at. And this is the, this is this will be the last thing that I talk about. This is an experiment that they did, um, which shows the efficacy of their um, lipopeptide. They took three ferrets, and I could go into why they used ferrets, but it has to do with their relationship to minks. It's very easy to infect ferrets. And they infected them with SARS-CoV-2. And then they, and they kept them separate in, a, in their own cage. And then they had three different cages with four ferrets each, two of them with mock um, in uh, administ administration of a mock nasal spray, and then the green ferrets got the actual lipopeptide nasal spray. Then they put one of the infected ferrets in each of these three cages and um, watched how the uh, infection spread from the infected ferret to the uninfected ferrets, the mock treated and the real treated ferrets. They left them like that for 24 hours, and then they separated the infected ferrets again and waited to see what happened. Um, they also, uh, it should be noted, they gave the uh, ferrets who got the actual lipopeptide more doses of lipopeptide on day three and day four. And what they found was that um, looking at viral load from the throat in these ferrets, the infected ferrets, of course, had a lot of viral load. Um, the uh, mock uh, treated ferrets, the red ones, uh, had a delay, but then again had a lot of virus. And then here's the green ones. These were the, the ferrets who got the lipopeptide and they did not have um, detectable virus except for a little bit of a blip here where they probably had some virus on them, but it was rejected by, because they had this uh, they were treated with this lipopeptide. So that six, all six ferrets who were treated with the lipopeptide spray were not were protected and did not seroconvert. And at the same time, the six ferrets who were treated with the mock spray were infected and did seroconvert. So this is a very exciting finding and something that I am definitely going to be keeping my eye on, and you should too. And with that, I'm going to have to stop. I have so much more to say, but we'll just say it next week. Okay, so I'll stop sharing and I'm happy to entertain questions. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Gold. That was, that was terrific. We'll get into some of the questions. Um, Dr. Shulman, um, our first speaker on cardiology had to step off. Um, so I'm not sure. Uh, I think what I'll do is I'll um, forward some of those questions to him and um, get those questions answered for you after the fact. Um, let's see, so here's a question regarding mRNA vaccines. If recipient muscle cells are um, con uh, constitutively activated to produce spike protein indefinitely, won't that cause a chronic pro-inflammatory state with attendant consequences? Um, you know, the idea behind um, the idea behind this. I mean, I think that's a that's an awesome question, actually. Um, as the spike protein is produced, it stimulates an immune response, and that immune response is going to start um, just, you know, destroying that spike protein that's being produced by the, the cells that are producing it, and those cells will eventually die. So I think that, I think overall, it's not gonna produce a chronic inflammatory state with ongoing forever production of um, spike protein because cells have a finite lifespan. So I think that that 
probably won't be a problem. Great, thank you. Any idea as to what caused the current large increase in infections in Milan, Italy? Uh, well, Milan, so I don't know about Milan specifically, but the current spike around the world is related to opening of venues that didn't used to be open. And now it's getting colder in a lot of the world so that people are being pushed indoors. And that's a setup for a super spreader when you have crowds indoors with even with one infected person. Um, that's wrong person, wrong uh, place, wrong time. Um, and people are just tired of um, complying with mitigation measures. And so they're not wearing masks, they're not social distancing, they're not avoiding crowds. And I think it's probably the same thing everywhere. And it is, that is what's happening here, definitely. And then there are, of course, the people who completely reject that this is a problem and don't follow any mitigation. That'd be a question measures. that was a question that was intended, I think, for Dr. Schulman, but I, I'm interested. I was going to ask it myself as well, and I think you, you might. Is for people with hypertension as a risk factor for more serious outcomes, is that controlled or uncontrolled, treated, untreated, and does it matter? And maybe the same could be asked about other risk factors like the quality of treatment and control of heart failure, to pick one example. So I only know about that or that early data from Wuhan, and I, I know that data because I, I presented that data showing that hypertension was really a risk factor, and this was controlled or uncontrolled. So a lot of these patients were on ACE inhibitors for their, um, for their hypertension control, and that's what sort of sparked this question about whether ACE inhibitors might be protective or make things worse. And so I believe it's controlled or uncontrolled. Uh, uh, confers risk. Thank you. And then I thought we could um, dive in. There were a couple of questions, comments um, about the storage of the Pfizer vaccine. And I know they talked about this at the very beginning and also, but um, storage of Pfizer vaccine at minus 70 degrees Celsius, burr. And then um, Dr. Doyle had commented uh, Moderna's vaccine requires a storage temperature of minus four degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, so um, the cold chain that's going to be required for this is going to present some um, really log logistical challenges. Um, the local departments of public health and the state departments of public health have been working on this um, and, and had to have um, this kind of cold storage chain established by November 1st. So hopefully um, they have plans for how they're going to keep, how they're going to store this vaccine and distribute it to um, the venues that are going to be administering it. it. Once it's out of the minus 70, I think it can be refrigerated for 24 hours and then it has to be discarded. Yeah, I think so the, the temperature thing is there's storage like shelf life storage. And then there's once it's out of the deep freeze, how long before you administer it? Can you have it at a different temperature before you get into the range of degrading, potential degrading? But, but to your point, I mean, like a lot of your rural hospitals aren't gonna have these freezers. So, so you know, how, how is it gonna work? It, it's a, there's a lot of people have given this a lot of thought. Right, and I, and I don't know the details, but um, I do understand that once it has defrosted out of the minus 70, um, that um, it's good for 24 hours. And then if there's any just left, it has to be discarded. So, and we don't wanna be discarding any of this vaccine. Right. So they're gonna to have to figure out exactly how many people will be able to take doses on any particular day. And different vaccines are gonna have different temperature requirements, different storage requirements based on their manufacturing and the other, the other molecules in the preparation. And so it's not like we're gonna say all vaccines, they may, there may be subtle differences and hopefully we'll, we're, we're gonna have more than one, we certainly hope, um, and they'll all have their own uh, storage and handling cold chain requirements. I, 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 can imagine, right. I can imagine a scenario where it requires minus 70 for an length of time, then has maybe a few days, who knows, uh, viability at standard freezer temperatures, but once thawed, has to be used even more quickly. But I think those, I, I, I can't imagine that Pfizer and other companies aren't working on exactly well, those well, questions. They, they, they are, are working on it. They are, but I think the question is, wouldn't you argue that a lot of flu vaccines go have to be tossed? If you've worked in a clinic, 
Oh, of course, um, of course. So, so that this is not, this isn't a new problem for COVID. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be some spoilage, you just know. And then you have to accommodate that when you've got a scarce resource. It's a big challenge. Right. But with the influenza vaccine, there's there's very rarely a shortage. And so exactly. and it's also very cheap. And so, you, you know, it's not a big deal. But because there's such a shortage of this kind of vaccine, we wouldn't want to be wasting doses. Right. Uh, the, the company, uh, Pfizer, has worked out a method for cold, maintaining a cold chain using dry ice in these particular kind of... Um, packaging system, but I still think it's going to be a tremendous challenge if for rural areas in the United States, but also for any part of the developing world, maintaining a vaccine at minus 70 is going to be, I, I just can't imagine how they're going to do it outside of a medical center. Um, any medical center that has a, you know, research lab has got a minus 70, but most places don't. Um, I just wanted to share some comments. Um, I had posed a question out to the clinics about whether they had seen an uptick in COVID positivity amongst their patients. And so um, Greenville Free Clinic um, said some, but not an increase. Um, Alliance Medical Center in Northern California has seen increases. Um, their, their county has 70% um, of the positives are people of Hispanic descent. At Volunteers in Medicine um, Clinic in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, it's in Luzerne County, and today they've had 4,711 positives in their state. In the past month, they have had 10 patients go for testing, two were positive, one had pneumonia but not hospitalized, and eight out of 10 were Latino, and both positives were Latino. And then from um, Green County um, Health Center in North Carolina. Our percent positive is stable at about 30 to 35 percent out of about 110 patients tested per week, most with symptoms, some contacts, and we have two patients currently hospitalized. We have seen no flu cases yet. Our counts and percent positive are stable, although North Carolina overall is mildly higher in case counts, but stable in hospitalizations. Eastern North Carolina Rural FQHC. Um, and a great uh, comment from school health clinics in Santa Clara County in California. More um, patients are refusing testing. Um, yep, and the, another clinic, Ryan um, Zaid says, yes, large increase is symptomatic and asymptomatic. So thank you so much, um, clinics, for sharing um, the, your experiences so far. I'm just going to take these final two questions. Um, any information in the virus mutation found in mink in Denmark? Yeah, so um, the virus is, so I haven't talked about minks. Um, but the virus has been spreading in mink farms in uh, Scandinavia for months, and it is mutating in the minks, and those uh, viruses are being transmitted from the minks to humans. Um, and there's, there are also mink farms in Utah, I just found out. Um, and so there is, there is concern about this, and um, there are mink farms that have been culling their minks um, to prevent um, further mutation and transmission to uh, humans. These mink farms are in rural areas, so there are not a lot of people around. Um, but um, I know that a mink farm recently called 3,400 minks um, to try and prevent this uh, transmission route from minks to humans. Um, but I haven't been following the mink story very carefully, so I, I don't really know more than that. Maybe somebody else has been Well, following. news reports say they've culled millions and millions of minks in Scandinavia. This is, it's, it's devastating that industry, at least for the time being. Great. And our final question, are there any pre-existing medical conditions that would prevent a patient or eliminate a patient from getting the mRNA vaccines? Um, right now, um, Oh, pre-existing medical conditions. So right now, I, I think children can't get it. Mm -hmm. um, children under twelve. Um, I, you know, I don't. I, I don't think there is an age cutoff. There's, and they included people with all comorbidities in the vaccine trial, and including obesity and morbid obesity. So I think that there are going to be no um, restrictions on adults uh, for getting this vaccine. Um, and in fact, it will be given to 
um, after healthcare workers and department, you know, government workers, it will be given to people with comorbidities and people over 65 first. Um, so I think they also included people with malignancies in the, uh, I'm not sure about that. But anyway, I don't think there are gonna be any restrictions on getting this vaccine. It's not a live vaccine. Great, thank you. Um, so Dr. Greif, Dr. Shepard, and Dr. Hurwitz um, will um, answer your questions offline. I'll go forward them on to Dr. Shulman in cardiology and as well as to um, Dr. Gold. So uh, Dr. Gold, thank you so much again for a great talk today and a big thanks to Dr. Shulman for giving the talk on um, cardiac manifestations. Thank you to our panel for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing all of you next week, um, same time, same place. And we will go ahead and uh, send you the information out uh, this coming Friday with a reminder on Tuesday. So great to see everybody. Have a good, safe, healthy week. Take care, everyone. <laughs>